So what would you say are the highlights of your career so far? Well, it's a work in progress. I just turned 76 a week ago, and I figure I got another 25 years, so I've got a quarter of my life still to go. And um, I'm having to figure out, okay, what can I do that would be different and better? Uh, how can I do a, a, a fourth act here and, and run through a game, game uh, up, up my game? Okay, so um, what I'm doing right now, well, let's go back. First stage of the game, childhood, through, you know, holding on to your mother's skirt up to where you're able to cause real trouble. And then um, I went to law school with the idea of being perhaps a one of the first cannabis attorneys right. who would uh, who would redirect the legal system to make uh, psychedelics legal. That didn't pan, pan out all that well. They didn't legalize it by the time I got out of law school. So a lot of my courses that I took were wasted. Um, but um, I got out of law school and I decided to put put the city out of my blood, get away from it for a while. And so I hiked the Appalachian Trail from north to south. And that's a, a trail that runs down the eastern North America along the Appalachian Ridge, 200 miles in a thousand day, 200 summits in a thousand days, over a thousand miles. And um, actually, it wasn't a thousand days. It was 109 days, thousand miles. And so um, that's interesting from a from a circular time perspective because my great 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 grandfather, seven generations removed, was Issachar Bates, who was a Shaker poet. He was a Revolutionary War soldier with George Washington throwing off the British yoke. And he then became, he fell in love with the Shakers and started to dance and was a fife player and a violin player and a dancer and a singer. And he wrote 400 Shaker hymns. And uh, he became a missionary for the Shakers and they sent him on these long treks out to talk to the colonies out into the distant wilderness. And he walked the Appalachian Trail, probably the same route I took. Mm -hmm. Wow. Out into the Ohio Valley in the uh, late part of the 18th century, where he set up um, two utopian communal colonies in the wilderness and um, had a confab with the prophet, who was the brother of Tecumseh, uh, who was. Um, thinking about throwing off the American yoke. Uh, and so they he was a, a protector of the native peoples as well. And so I found that I had these commonalities in my life experience where I was recapitulating my ancestors' journey through life, walking the same mountain trails, starting utopian communities in the wilderness, um, learning to make friends with adversaries, in our case, the redneck Tennesseans who, who didn't understand hippies. Um, and, and, and so I was, I was finding myself in my second phase, age 25 to 50, in that um, community building phase where I was developing the, the farm as a village developing businesses like our mushroom people business that was doing um, medicinal forest mushrooms and our um, second foundation, which was a charitable organization uh, and our plenty, which is our international charity. And um, I was a, a lawyer. So I had graduated from law school. I had no use for it at first, but after several years at the farm, we started noticing that there were these things called nuclear plants that were sort of popping up like mushrooms after a rain around us. And I, we had to do something about that. It, that was, those are pretty nasty. And so uh, I got asked to go out and, and stop that, stop that nonsense. And so I, I handled nuclear cases as a law project. It was called the Natural Rights Center. And we fought, uh, you know, four times to the United States Supreme Court. We ended the Tennessee Valley Authority's nuclear program, which had had 20 reactors scheduled. Uh, and we uh, eventually stopped them, essentially stopped them. We, we, we fought them to a standstill in, in North America. 
I then left uh, that uh, out of stress and got more into my mushroom business. Uh, I found, you know, the the law the law office thing was fine for a number of years. I was kind of like the the uh, the warrior. If you read Mollison's uh, Travels and Dreams, he talks about um, the warrior mentality, and that was my my life as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, but then post that, I I got more into regenerative ag and back into the the basics of of agroforestry and things like that. I started working with uh, Chris Nesbitt down in Belize. Uh, he had run some Maya Mountain Research Farm. He's another good interview for you. Uh, and Chris uh, is a big agroforestry guy using traditional Mayan uh, style that a lot of which had gone extinct, but he's revitalizing and reusing and it's climate resilient. So I'm still working with Chris even today doing ridge to reef programs to restore the Mayan coral reef. That's one of the reasons I'm in these parts right now. And so that was like the the uh, the third phase, age fifty and beyond, uh, where I'm now focused pretty much on climate change, full time as an emergency planetary technician. So they've you know they dispatched my ambulance to this particular planet, and uh, you know I'm, I'm doing triage, figuring out what's next. What do we got to do here? Can we can we uh, stabilize the patient before we transport? Uh, and uh, that's and I'm using all of the various means of drawdown that that uh, Paul Hawken talks about in his books. Um, I, I have a full kit there of natural climate solutions that's in my my jump bag. And um, the main thing that I'm probably best known for is biochar. I've written a number of books on it, but here in in um, in where I am right now in Mexico, this is. This is my Hemingway machine. So what I do is I write, and uh, that's kind of age seventy six and beyond is mostly probably what I'm going to be doing. A number of uh, years ago, I wrote um, "Climate in Crisis," mm. forward by Al Gore, which was uh, my first book on climate. This was uh, this came out the same year as I met Bill Mollison, nineteen ninety. Probably had it with me when I saw him, and then. Uh, the next uh, book I'm known for is The Biochar Solution. Yeah. This one came out in, in uh, 2009, 2010, somewhere around there. It was after I went to a permaculture gathering in uh, um, Brazil. Yeah. And we've been working with Andre Suarez doing uh, permaculture, eco-village training center kind of stuff. He'd come up to the farm in Tennessee for a season as an apprentice. And I've been working with him in, for a number of years. And so he introduced me to the Terra Preta do Indio, yeah. the dark earths of the Indians. And I started to learn about biochar from him. <laughs> and that led me to the biochar solution and writing that up. And, and then more recently, uh, we started looking at the non-agricultural uses of biochar, yeah. which led, led us to this book, mm -hmm. uh, Burn, uh, which is um, uh, now out in... Um, German as uh, cool down. Wow. So if you if you don't understand the German word for burn is cool down. Uh, that's the translation. Uh, and uh, it's also going into Chinese and Italian. And um, and then I, I started doing well during the during the whole run up to the Paris Agreement, I was going to the UN on a regular basis at all the conferences. And so I wrote the story of how they got to the Paris Agreement. Uh, and that was it came out in 2015. And then um, while I've been in, in here in Mexico, I've come out with a book, a number of series on planetary technician uh, processes. One of those is transforming plastic about how to take plastic and turn it from a problem to a solution, mm -hmm. how to deal with the plastic problem, particularly when it relates to the oceans. This is a book on the dark side of the ocean which talks about the so-called blue economy or carbon, blue carbon, the idea that, that the oceans are infinite and they're not, and how we're actually destroying them, but we don't see it. Uh, and it talks about alkalinity and salinity and, and uh, sea level rise and extinction of, of uh, marine mammals and all that kinds of stuff, good stuff. But because it's so interesting, I decided we needed to create some children's books. And so I 
I, I started wow. making these books into kids books for, you know, uh, middle school and, and yeah. um, that sort of thing. And so you could um, learn about the ocean or learn about uh, these other subjects, mm, see the cuddly animals and understand the, the effects of pollution and maybe what you're doing, what you're, what you're sending down the trash chute. Uh, and then also on plastics, I got this one called Taming Plastic for Kids mm. uh, about things that they can do to uh, reduce their Thanks. microplastic footprint and how they can separate their different kinds of plastics and find things, useful things to do with them uh, rather than uh, make a problem out of them, but, but actually shaping a new future using the recycled plastic. And, and then finally here in, during the pandemic, I came up with a book on the history of plagues and it's also about about surviving this one and, and how how you know if you give us a report card we're failing uh failing on the on the plague the same way we're failing on the climate uh you know some of us have done better than others i'm a big fan of uh, prime minister arden in new zealand but uh i i have um you know a lot of problems with the ways that that millions of people are dying from just stupidity and uh and so yeah, that's kind of what I'm doing here is in my fourth phase is is publishing. And a lot of why I'm anxious and eager and help and grateful for ha uh, having you do this podcast is that I, I it allows me to um, publish, to be able to say things mm -hmm. and get it out to a larger number of people. So it doesn't just die with me. Yeah. How do you stay hopeful? It's so easy to get quite um, depressed with all of these challenges that you can see and you can see the stupidity how do you stay hopeful <laughs> yeah cultivating a sense of humor helps so uh, what do i deal how do i deal with that internally uh, how do i process that and some of it is is buddhist non-attachment mm. you know we may have been screwed before i was born you know, the trajectory we were on could well have been set well before I was born. Mm. And I'm just along for the ride. Now, I have a bailing bucket in this sinking ship, so I'm going to bail because it makes me feel good to be doing something positive. And as long as I have the ability to do something, I'm going to keep doing it because I also know there's a certain mathematical equation, a function here, which is if you don't do it, even if there's just the slimmest of chances, well, if you don't do it, there's no chance at all. So you have to at least try because otherwise you're screwed for sure. And if you have just the slimmest of chances, that maybe we can have more forest and we can use algae and we can pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and we can do all these things, change lifestyle. At some point we will, hopefully, maybe we will. And so then it's necessary that we we show the way. So for that reason, I stay hopeful, you know, not just to be able to keep doing something and not totally despair or become a nihilist. Uh, I, I, I just know that it's it's more fun to get up in the morning with a spring in your step because you got something good you can be doing you ultimately don't have a say it's going to happen because there's just so many of us it's not up to just one individual because part of the solution has to be making it fun if it isn't going to be fun if it isn't fun nobody's going to do it and so finding solutions is one thing but then finding ways to make solutions fun that's even more important and that's why I write kids books. And that's why I work with uh, Chris Nesbitt at the Maya Mountain Research Farm because he has children's programs. Same thing we do in Tennessee. We have the Eco Village Training Center now, does a lot of programs with the farm school. And that and we make it fun. You know, we make it so that you can get into the mud and make cob and build buildings and get all muddy and get your face all muddy and have a party. And and all of that is is really important because it it's if it ain't fun, ain't nobody gonna do it. Thank you.